Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about how uh, Aerospike actually helped us uh, in a big time with respect to Big Basket. I mean, we're going to cover uh, these things uh, here. So we're going to start with, uh, I mean, I think pretty much everyone knows Big Basket, just in case if anyone doesn't know, I'm going to cover Big Basket. And of course, uh, the use cases we have at Big Basket and clearly uh, the journey we had with Big Basket since about five, six years. And of course, uh, the scale of Big Basket and you know, the, uh, the kind of challenges we actually had with respect to aerospace clusters, I mean, not, not specifically with respect to downtimes, but in general. Uh, and of course, like a few asks uh, we had. And of course, I think Srini covered a few things uh, previously uh, in 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. These are actually covered. So technically, I should just remove that slide here, but just in case, yeah. OK, uh, about Big Basket, uh, uh, we are number one online groceries uh, platform uh, in India. So we, uh, we do about uh, four to five lakh orders per day. And uh, we are hosted in, uh, I mean, we are completely hosted in AWS. And we operate uh, uh, in about 70 cities. Uh, in terms of you know, the, the scale of the events and the, in terms of the uh, number of, uh, number of in infrastructure related events and all that, we, we, talk, we do about you know, nine lakh uh, Kafka events uh, per every minute. And of course, like we are a polyglot shop. We happen to be. Uh, a monolithic, a monolithic shop uh, earlier, uh, back in 2016-17 timeline, after which we migrated towards a fully uh, microservices platform. So we still do have a monolithic you know, as a legacy thing, which we, are, which we want to eventually shut down. And of course, uh, like 80 or 90 odd microservices running across different, different uh, uh, features. Uh, this is our Aerospike journey, uh, st starting with uh, 2015, which is the pre aerospike era, I would say. Uh, we were actually using Memcached and a little bit of Redis earlier. Uh, after that, I think uh, in 2016, so that's when we wanted to go down the path of having a distributed caching solution. So uh, with respect to uh, the cache, which is primarily for many of the different uh, uh, workloads, uh, we wanted to have very realistic uh, real-time data being shown to the end users. So it could be starting from all the way from uh, Start, uh, whenever you are actually logging into bigbasket.com, even on the mobile or even on the uh, browser, any, any sort of a medium, you would typically have a window showing up uh, asking you to select the address or the apartment or the pin code uh, you, would, you would expect uh, to feed. And then after which, the whole catalog, the product catalog, and many things change. And including after you add the items into the cart, you know, a realistic check actually happens to check if these items are available at the warehouse. And even the address selections and all that, right? So what if you happen to select an address which is not even serviceable by Big Basket? Maybe you are from rural uh, uh, area or even from the outskirts of a given city. So all these checks actually happen pretty much in real time. And Aerospec actually plays a really strong role there. And uh, so, so back in 2016, that's when we ventured into uh, the world of Aerospec. And, uh, so starting 2016, you know, all the way till 2018, 2019, of course, the COVID thing came uh, after that, you know, right now in 2022. So we, from the compute side, from the application standpoint, I would say uh, back in 2016, if I remember correctly, we were doing about 30 odd uh, EC2 machines, pretty much, 30 or 40 odd. And of course, that actually became like thousands uh, in now in 2022. But if you happen to see the Aerospike uh, data layer uh, related uh, setup, Back then, we were actually running maybe two, three machines. Right now, we are actually running 11. That's pretty much it. So the compute actually scaled you know, maybe like 30x, but the, 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 the data layer related uh, setup didn't really, uh, we, ha we didn't really have a need to actually scale it uh, uh, at the aerospike level also. So, uh, so back uh, in 2017, uh, in 2016, we started pushing the aerospike as a caching solution, I would say, more like a key value store, a traditional key value store. Uh, of course, it's distributed. Of course, it's replicated and all that. And back in 2017, we thought, okay, let's push down the uh, not just as a key value store. We wanted to put a lot more persistent data also, like a source of truth related thing. So, if you happen to see uh, the, uh, the there's a thing called Smart Basket in Big Basket UI. Uh, uh, any anything uh, you don't you don't have to explicitly select every single item in the cart. These things are actually automatically learned from your previous uh, purchase history, and a cart is readily available to you. And you just click on a button and says, you know, add, uh, add, all, add all these things to the cart. And this is pretty much called Smart Basket. It was completely powered by Aerospike. 
uh, back in 2017, and that's actually coming from a source, source of truth related data exclusively in Aerospike. Uh, so that's when we went uh, sorry, entered into uh, the Aerospike persistent related uh, uh, solution. I think uh, from uh, from 2018, 2019 timeline, of course, uh, from the Aerospike feature standpoint, we didn't actually see any uh, any uh, problems and things like that. We happen to have, you know, I think pretty much everyone knows the heartbeat attack, you know, uh, the, the the meltdown spectre attacks and all that, where our P99s actually, just like any other uh, 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 pl platform as a solution, for example, uh, the cloud solution, you would actually see uh, performance getting hit. And our P99s, which are usually in the order of you know one millisecond, very worst case, like two milliseconds, uh, touched all the way till nine, eight, milli nine, ten milliseconds, and the whole uh, clusters were actually having a problem back then. That was the only time where we can actually visibly remember there was a aerospike related. Uh, outage, right? So technically, it was not an outage; it was more like a latency-related problem, but actually triggered a, a cascaded outage for uh, quite a quite a few downstream services. So uh, I think back in 2019, we we moved uh, from 3.12 version, which was a little older version, and we moved to 4.5. And uh, of course, uh, we are on 4.5 at the moment, and uh, of course, we are looking forward to Price 6.0, which actually has a native JSON support, and of course, graph uh, data models are also going to come. And clearly, we would like to have uh, uh, very good advantage uh, taken from them. And uh, from the uh, traffic wise, uh, I would say, you know, right from 2016, 17, all the way till now, uh, I think maybe pre COVID it was like uh, if, if, you, if some X number of writes are there, X number of reads are there, I think they have become 2X and 3X uh, now. And of course, they're going to grow even higher. So even just the, the number of orders volume is actually ex expected to go 2X or 3X by the end of this year. And clearly, that would actually have a cascading effect on the caching layer, uh, clearly, and also the persistence layer. And uh, so we are actually uh, trying to beef up more in terms of network uh, monitoring also, along with the capacity planning and all that. So this is our uh, Aerospec numbers at the moment, uh, just in case if anyone is curious. The entire big basket uh, runs on a 11-node uh, Aerospec cluster, uh, which is i3, uh, 6N, uh, i3 EN 6XL instance. Uh, and uh, uh, like we are currently hosted in one single place, but clearly we want to go down the path of breaking that into uh, multiple clusters, purely from the uh, you know disaster recovery perspective and purely from the reliability standpoint. Just in case if anything happens uh, at the at the cloud level, for example, when the rack goes down, things like that. So uh, our as I said, like we uh, we do have uh, put a lot of uh, content into Aerospike. We we have billions and billions of objects on Aerospike, and we do roughly 140k reads per second, and, uh, and uh, maybe 20,000 writes per second, and uh, ex exclusively across both the in-memory and as well the persistent namespaces. And uh, the, the footprint is pretty much around uh, one terabit of disk, and then maybe 500 GBs of RAM, pretty much. So uh, with respect to Aerospike, uh, the monitoring, right? So although we do have a single Aerospike cluster, uh, clearly we have seen cases where the, uh, the AMC, for example, Aerospike Management Console, was not, uh, was not able to provide historical data over the course of time. And clearly, I think that's getting decommissioned. And clearly, Aerospike Prometheus Exporter is actually going to be there for the long term. And uh, we happened to use it uh, last year. And then this is our setup like. Uh, all our infrastructure setups are usually uh, done through Terraform. Sensible, so including the data layer setups like Kafka and Aerospike, for example. Uh, so we have uh, we use Jenkins as our glorified, you know, build runner, a uh, task runner, and that actually spins up the uh, Aerospike related infrastructure in the click of a, a button or a link. And and clearly, you know, even if you uh, want to attach more nodes, which is usually the rare case with respect to Aerospike, or even when you want to terminate a node, uh, just a few lines change, and then you get the whole thing done. Including the aerospike monitoring and as well the, the the disks, even the placement groups, for example, which which are really important with respect to aerospike. Uh, you just want to make sure the aerospike VMs, the cloud VMs, are actually properly placed on different different racks. Uh, they're spread across different racks so that you don't actually have uh, an outage. So, including the placement groups, everything is actually automated through Terraform. And uh, of course, if anything goes wrong regarding you know uh, tail latencies like reads, writes, and all that. Uh, you have uh, the new relic dashboards. You have the the obscene uh, calls, and everything is integrated, so that you know if if at all things go bad regarding P99, for example, on a read, for example, you would you would uh, sufficiently you know you would immediately get paged, and then clearly uh, corresponding person actually gets into the scene. 
Uh, with respect to use cases at BB, which is primarily the uh, reason for this talk, uh, we, we use BB primarily as a key value store to start with. Uh, we use, uh, there's a single bin concept. I mean, uh, it's not like at a namespace level, but we do have uh, namespaces. Uh, we do have sets which are actually having single bin primarily. And uh, of course, majority of, uh, not primarily, but uh, to, to some extent, and uh, the majority of them are multi-bins. So you, just like a traditional table, for example. And uh, we have different uh, data types being used. We primarily use it for a string, numeric, and uh, also GeoJSON. So if, if at all, if, if, any, if any of you, you know, try to place an order in Big Basket and to actually check if the, uh, the order, if the member-related address is actually serviceable or not, it actually happens to uh, be queried using Aerospike, using GeoJSON-related uh, uh, features. So uh, we also use uh, uh, Aerospike as a model cache, so model in, the sum, in, in terms of you know DB schema, I would say. So uh, we started with uh, our uh, the whole journey with a monolithic system, which is primarily built on Django, uh, which is a Python framework, as you may know. And uh, we happened to override the ORM uh, internally, and then happened to uh, bake in the Aerospike-related uh, uh, wrappers into it, so that if any if at all anyone is actually trying to place an order or just updating an address, for example, it actually writes it into Aerospike cache uh, in a built-in way uh, using, you know, uh, different, different, you know, it could be set, it could be, you know, multi-read, whatnot. Everything is actually overridden at a model level so that, you know, people, uh, up, up, I mean, developers would not actually have to explicitly, you know, uh, doesn't need to code a logic which says, you know, write into this Aerospike set, write into that Aerospike set, delete that record from set. Uh, set the TTL and things like that. It's actually handled at an ORM level. So that's how initially we, we made sure the entire uh, Big Basket ecosystem of apps uh, takes advantage of the Aerospike, you know, uh, pretty awesome TTLs uh, right from the ground up so that people don't have to code anything explicitly. So that's, uh, that's one use case. And of course, uh, uh, since, you know, as I said, like we actually have source of fruit related data also into Aerospike. So there are certain sets which are exclusively in Aerospike, which are not into any, um, database sort of a solution. So we ensure that, you know, uh, evictions are actually completely off during that. So just in case if the disk is under pressure or, you know, uh, or, you know, memory related contentions are there, clearly eviction actually gets into the seed and then it actually is going to purge the data. So we just ensure that, you know, eviction is, is completely turned off regarding those source of truth related sets. And uh, uh, wherever, you know, applications are actually doing, it could be the monolith system, it could be the microservices in general. We ensure that, you know, multi-reads are always happening. You don't actually waste bandwidth in terms of a number of uh, a number of calls to Aerospike. Uh, although uh, latency-wise, it's pretty good, but we ensure that you know there could be a, a report which is actually being prepared by a, a distribution center or a warehouse, like to understand how is uh, uh, an SKU, like stock keeping unit, is actually performing at a city level, at a hub level, at a DC level. So all these things actually happen, uh, you know, in real time and pretty much. And not just one SKU, uh, you, there could be like thousands of SKUs. You would like to understand how this is, how an SKU is actually behaving uh, if you're a vendor, for example. So all these things uh, use multi-reads uh, like crazy. So uh, we use, make use of that. And as I said, like we use uh, GeoJSON related uh, features uh, in Aerospike so that uh, to actually find out if, uh, if an address is actually serviceable uh, by Big Basket or not serviceable by Big Basket. Uh, so there are a few learnings from the outages we had, so I thought I would like to share with you. So uh, as I said, uh, a little bit of disclaimer. So these outages are not exclusive to the Aerospike as such. They could happen to anything, and these outages didn't really happen just because of fault in Aerospike, but in general, it, this uh, outages happened to uh, hit uh, the Aerospike clusters we have. So uh, the, the first fundamental thing was, uh, I think back in 2019 or 18 timeline, where uh, we use uh, Akamai as the CDN cache. So uh, just in case if you happen to browse bigbasket.com and see the CD selection, see the, uh, the, the SKU catalog, the products, uh, things available within a city, these are exclusively served from Akamai CD and Cache. So one time what happened was like, you know, uh, there was a case where uh, one of the engineers, a senior engineers would like to try a, f a new thing with respect to the cache so that they are actually having a d different data structure in the cache. So they turned off the CD and Cache and uh, all the data actually happened to uh, you know, happened to uh, be fetched from Aerospike. So the Aerospike machines actually got flooded with a ton of reads from uh, which are offloaded to uh, which are offloaded from CDN. So that's when the entire Aerospike cluster went out of memory. So I think in the in the span of uh, maybe an hour or so, uh, the number of reads, the number of writes, became two x. So and it was like consistent, and we were not too sure why the sudden traffic actually surged. And clearly, we figured out okay, it was the CDN cache which actually turned off. So 
after that thing uh, there was a strong uh, protocol to follow where you know clearly if some things are actually offloaded to uh, uh, it could be the load balancer or it could be to the you know data layer for example they'll be having a stringent uh, procedure so that everyone is aware how much of traffic you're actually offloading to offloading from the cdm so that was like an interesting outage we had and uh, uh, the other one was like you know there is the quite recent one which happened uh, back in jan 2022 so we actually happened to since we are seeing uh, quite a phenomenal you know uh, traffic surge in terms of number of reads a number of writes to aerospike i think if i remember correctly back in 2019 the pre covid time it was it was doing around 25000 reads per second and maybe like 4k or 5k uh, writes per second that actually happened to be 140k which is like eight times six times so uh, just after the covid right so during the covid what not so so clearly just like a, uh, the aerospike is very well known to have uh, a thing like a you know, fit and forget so, sort of a solution right so we don't actually pay attention so much to aerospike technically because clearly it is actually doing very well so we we usually have uh, these um, uh, what do you call the uh, the load metrics and everything uh, uh, shown in terms of you know cpu load and all that but we didn't really pay attention so much to the the network level so we happen to see network packet drops at a at a ec2 instance level so we were actually running i3 i think uh, 2xl or something like that and then uh, clearly there was a uh, bandwidth crunch at the network level and uh, we happened to you know monitor it when we figured out okay these machines are not able to cut it and clearly with 6x load or 8x load it's they're not able to cut it we have to upgrade so this is one other uh, interesting use case where like we believed you know pretty much with respect to aerospike you know memory and cpu are the only cpu is very rarely the case but the memory is usually the crunch but technically even network also happen to be under uh, congestion so uh, so that's where we are currently we are running uh, i would say a fairly small aerospike cluster like a lever node cluster which is completely i3 an 6xl and uh, a few asks i think as i said earlier uh, pretty much this this whole slide can be taken away because clearly i, I happen to see from this rini stock that you know uh, from 6.1 and 6.2 or 3 uh, many of these are actually uh, going to be coming up so we uh, like many of our devops engineers actually dread aerospike only because of only one reason because of these you know restarts like these restarts actually take a lot of time and uh, like although from everyone love to work with aerospike but these uh, you know whenever there is a maintenance window whenever they we want to you know, see things i mean especially the secondary indices which need to be loaded into ram and all that they happen to you know eat up a lot of bandwidth so even for a lever node cluster we have to have a very long window of uh, you know restarts so that was like the first task i think i'm really glad to see that coming in 6.1 and of course uh, the other one uh, uh, which is uh, really uh, something which i would like to ask is like on demand namespace creation so without the re restarts because namespaces are typically you know at the conceptual level you tend to map them as a database in general or you can actually create databases on the fly but namespaces technically with respect to aerospace cannot be created on the fly uh, so i would uh, i mean if this this actually is is in the works i would be really happy to see that and uh, uh, a very good visibility on the hot keys right so uh, with respect to aerospike i mean if you're coming from redis world or even from the memcached world so clearly you would you can actually pull up certain metrics out of the box and figure out which keys are actually really hot which keys are actually like you would actually have an uneven distribution of uh, the load in the cluster just because of one hot key and things like that so uh, i mean this may this may be a little too much to ask but um, if monitoring at a key level is available out of the box it it it's, it's one of the, one of the system uh, less to maintain right so and of course arm 64 support like uh, some of us actually run uh, m once so uh, clearly from the developer standpoint you know it would actually boost the uh, developer productivity if we can actually just have uh, the aerospike uh, the community edition or the enterprise edition running in a local docker container so i think i'm really happy to see that in the 6.2 and 6.3 yeah i think that's pretty much what i have okay koshik yeah go ahead i think i'm good here yeah. sure G give you a mic sorry get uh, him a mic please so the question is that it so th so the got it got it so the ma the main uh, the question is like uh, do we really want to have an on demand namespace creation hello <laughs> so there's a saying right i mean every developers you know uh, uh, dream is devops nightmare right so 
everyone would like to have you know everything created on the fly technically but from the devops and the security and even the, from the sre standpoint you would not like to have it they right? clearly want to have a stringent protocol so the reason why we were uh, looking for on down space creation not in terms of you know uh, the flexibility per se but to avoid these restarts so because as i said like the from the secondary namespace uh, secondary index standpoint every namespace you create you would love to have it created but it actually has a very large rolling window right so it might actually even for a love node cluster i think we have seen cases where it would actually take more than 10 15 hours so clearly we don't want to have you know an already tested devops team to actually have uh, this thing only for that context we want to have a on on demand namespace creation but yes i'm already i mean i'm all interested to know the you know uh, a very strong protocol to be followed for namespace creation including a database so yeah that answers your question yeah so any other questions yeah go ahead Uh, itself uh. right so uh, aerospace being uh, you know partition tolerant system and of course it's a distributed cache right so clearly mm -hmm. you know uh, so, sorry uh, to just repeat the question as the business grows would the aerospace automatically realign according to the the growth right the growth in terms of reads writes what not i mean we have seen cases where uh, although we we typically don't over provision the aerospace cluster uh, like in a huge amount we actually have a sufficient buffer but we have seen cases where uh, aerospace once is set up you you can you can just leave it running for about 6 to 12 months without any uh, serious investment in terms of operations so yes uh, with respect to big basket uh, yes we have seen cases where inside 6 months inside uh, inside 12 months our growth factor uh, exclusive with respect to uh, aerospace uh, you know became you know 3x 4x 5x and we have seen cases where the existing cluster without even you know any slight tinkering was able to sustain so and of course like any other uh, healthy system like any other system operational system which is under stress you have to ensure that you know at a network level you don't have a congestion at a cpu level or a disk level or even at a ram level you don't have a congestion so that's on the the ops team uh, i would say but uh, so far our experience is actually pretty good yeah you need to provide more uh, arm cores to S to manage that perhaps arm cores sorry i didn't get uh, arm arm cores okay okay the, the yes uh, i mean on the arm 64 i don't think we have a support yet but uh, we're going to have but uh, from the i think we are exclusively on the intel you know uh, technology on the aws so yeah so far it's working out well for us yeah but if you're looking forward to have arm 64 support yeah thank you okay thank you please yeah uh, you said uh, that uh, network uh, uh, packet drops right is there any limitation in the data transfer uh, say from uh, your uh, uh, warehouse to skus and all that no i mean we are exclusive on the aws i would say technically the data is never flowing out of aws to the dcs and on all that so it's exclusive it's exclusively at an aws vpc level but we have seen at a instance level for example at a lac level or a vm level for example we have seen the contention at, uh, regarding the network so these are i think uh, we were running quite a large setup uh, with respect to aerospike prior to the i3.6xl we were running like 21 nodes or 23 nodes cluster which is running i3.2xl which is having uh, the the baseline as 10 gbps and the burst is like 25 uh, or something like that and we were actually hitting that burst constantly because uh, uh, with respect to i mean we have this usual practice that you know uh with respect to kafka we pay attention so much every every quarter and all that with respect to databases we pay attention but with respect to aerospike just set it up and then leave it running you don't have to exclusively pay attention every quarter technically but we have seen cases you know uh, which is which is like a reminder to us telling that at a network level also in general just have to co have a constant uh, health check being done so that you know uh, aws also provides a, a plethora of tools to actually figure out uh, what is actually getting dropped at a network level so uh, so we figured out and then and it was like a cake walk for us just bomb the instance type and of course everything is set up through terraform so we don't have any problem okay any other questions okay thank you all